Hello everybody and welcome to Tent 1 David Cato. We will have our first event here, Norm Critical Thinking at Work by Elin Firm from Norm. Uh, we are not so many here in the tent, so if any of you watching at home have some questions, feel free to send them in and uh, give some uh, yeah, comments on the while uh, Elin is uh, talking, so uh, we have some talking points uh, afterwards if we have the time for it. For Elin, will you take it away? Thank you, uh, and welcome to everyone here and at home uh, to this lecture about non-critical thinking at work. Um, I'm very happy to be here today and take part in this year's brilliant human rights program. Um, my name is Elin, and I go by she, her, and her pronouns. Um, I have a master in anthropology and gender studies and I have six years experience working with diversity, inclusion, and non-critical thinking um, in several, several different organizational settings. Um, together with my partner, Stina Kunkel, I've started NORM, a consulting firm that helps organizations work with these topics in a sustainable manner. Um, and as our name might reveal, we work a lot with norms, and what that is, uh, I'll talk a lot more about in a moment. Um, today's lecture is about 50 minutes, uh, so we won't really have time for lots of questions during the presentation. But if you can think of anything, write it down, uh, and hopefully we'll have time at the end. Or um, if not, you can just catch me afterwards, I'll be hanging around. Um, or you can email if you're uh, watching from home, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Um, and before starting today, uh, I'd like to invite you to think about the fact that we enter this space with quite different understandings of norm-critical thinking. Um, so you might never really have heard about it before and you come to hear what it's about, or you might work with it uh, yourself. Um, and we also work in quite different fields, perhaps. Um, so the point is today to take this home to your context um, and think about how can this be used at your workplace, for example. Uh, and if it feels very familiar or easy, then maybe think about how could I take this home and pass it on to my colleagues and workmates. Okay. So, what's the actual topic that we're here to talk about today? Um, well, diversity and inclusion has become a key aspect of modern organizational development. Um, and that's not only to work actively uh, against discrimination in the workplace, but also because a lot of leaders have realized um, that a diverse and inclusive workplace helps the organization develop and become more innovative. Um, but what does it actually mean, diversity and inclusion, in an organizational setting? Well, simply put, um, diversity is about creating an organization uh, that reflects the diverse society that we live in. Um, you could say that it's something that you can more easily measure or count, um, unlike inclusion, that is a little bit more abstract. But inclusion is really important because this is what makes the diverse workforce want to stay. Um, so inclusion is about creating an organizational culture where people can feel comfortable and encouraged to be who they are in the workplace and where each coworker's um, unique perspective, experience, and talent is valued. But changing organizational culture isn't always that easy, so it can be a little bit difficult to, to know where to start. Um, but lately, then, uh, organizations have turned to norm-critical thinking to work with this in practice. And that's, therefore, what we will be talking about today, both about what it is uh, and how it can be used in an organizational setting. So, what is norm-critical thinking? Um, well, in smaller, non-COVID settings, we usually start this type of uh, lecture uh, with a small exercise to illustrate norm-critical thinking. Um, the participants get a small piece of paper that they scrunch into a bowl, and then they try and hit uh, a bin that I hold up from where they're sitting in the room. Um, it's usually quite funny, but it also uh, illustrates how we have different opportunities uh, to hit this bin from where we're sitting. 
And then in combination with this picture that you can see here on the screen, uh, it gives us a good starting point to talk about what non-critical thinking is. Um, because as you can see here, we have two running tracks, uh, one with a white person um, that can be read as man, and he only has two small obstacles uh, on his way, and then a person who can be read as a black woman with a lot of different uh, dangerous obstacles on their way. And then the white man asks, what's the matter? It's the same distance. Um, and in order to change unequal conditions in society um, and work with things like this and the obstacles that we face, we can work in different ways. Um, we can focus on the track full of obstacles through what's called like a rights perspective. So enacting laws that give uh, groups who are often disadvantaged, extra protection. Um, but we could also shift focus to work on uh, the track without all the extra obstacles um, and look at, well, first of all, recognize that the obstacles are, are there and the tracks are different um, and that and ask why this is and what this means for these two people's way of moving in the world. So, for example, at work. And that's what's called a non-critical perspective. And uh, sometimes when I hold these workshops, uh, people will say, oh, but you know, I don't see people's skill set or I don't care about it. Uh, I, only, I don't see color, I don't see gender, sexuality, or I only see you know, how, how good people are at their job. Um, or they say, I already treat everyone at work the exact same way. Uh, and then they say, oh, do I really have to listen to this? You know, I already know it. Uh, and surprise, surprise, the answer is yes, you have to listen. Uh, and uh, for a couple of different reasons. Um, first of all, uh, it's to do with our brain, because our brains constantly receive a huge amount of data. Um, but there's just a tiny bit of it that's received consciously, and the rest we take in unconsciously. And to manage this huge amount of data, our brain subconsciously takes a lot of shortcuts and makes a whole lot of assumptions based on what it has seen or learnt before. And this leads to what we call uh, unconscious bias. And unconscious bias basically means that even when we think we treat people the same, we don't. Uh, and as you can imagine, this has some big consequences in, for example, hiring, promotion, medical treatment, and also decisions related to criminal justice. Um, a work-related example of this, um, you might have heard of uh, Yale University conducted a major study on recruitment. Uh, where they created a fictional student that they sent out to, um, to 200 different science professors across top universities in the US. And then the professors were asked to evaluate how competent the student was, how likely they would be to hire them, how much they would pay them, and how willing they would be to mentor the student. Um, and all the applications they sent out were identical. Uh, apart from the fact that half of them were for an applicant named John and the other half were for an applicant named Jennifer. And the results showed that with statistical significance, both male and female faculty at these institutions were more likely to hire and to mentor the applicant named John and were also willing to pay this applicant um, uh, 26,000 Danish kroner uh, more annually than the other applicant, um, etc. And even, so the point being that even researchers who work with being objective uh, made unconscious assumptions about competence based solely on the name uh, on the application. And as you may know, similar studies have been done on age and ethnicity where the results are uh, even worse. And the second reason for listening today uh, is about the fact that treating everyone the same isn't always a good idea, actually. Um, as you can see in this first image here, there's a poor neighborhood that gets the same amount of community resources as the rich, and then it stays poor. Whereas if we instead work to divide resources in relation to needs, like in the second picture here, uh, we can create a world where people are given the same opportunities to succeed despite their different starting points. Meaning that we first have to begin by acknowledging that we have different starting points and then level the playing field in relation to this. So for example, allocating different amounts of community resources. 
And in order to see these different starting points, um, we can use a norm-critical approach. And to use a norm-critical approach, uh, we need to kind of begin to look at what are norms. Um, and often they're described as unwritten rules um, because they're up upholding what is considered normal and obvious. Um, so that could be, for example, standing on a particular side of the escalators, um, greeting others with a handshake, which is now not, no longer the norm, and that also means that they can change, um, or getting to a meeting on time, depending on where you are. Um, but it means that norms are often invisible until they are challenged. So, for example, if you're in the UK and you stand on the other, or on your normal side of the escalators, you'll soon notice that that's not the norm in the UK. Um, or if you go in for a kiss on the cheek instead of a handshake, you'll also get a reaction that exposes this norm. Um, and when we start looking for norms, we can see that they exist everywhere, but they look quite different. Um, and they're not all bad, uh, but some of them can help us create order. So for example, standing on a particular side of the escalator, so queuing. Um, but what we want to focus on here uh, is that some of them can also be very limiting and lead to exclusion because they create ideas and expectations about what is normal in our society and what isn't. Uh, so for example, the fact that everyone uh, can use uh, the escalators or that everyone uh, should be able to enter a building um, that only has stairs. That's a limiting norm. And it's exactly the limiting aspect of norms uh, that, needs, that means that we need to be critical towards them. And so a classic example is the gender binary and the different expectations placed on what we read as boys and girls. Um, because even before the day we're born, society starts treating us differently uh, due to the gender that we're assigned. So toys, clothes, and even sweets are covered in gendered messages about you know, tough guys and little princesses. Uh, and uh, things like clothes are made in uh, different sizes or designs. So boy clothes often have space to move and have pockets. Um, and as you can see on this picture here, I don't know if you can read, but um, this is the boy laptops are made with 50 functions and girl laptops are made with 25 functions for no reason. And the point here being that this isn't, uh, this does not only actively divide us into two opposing genders, but it also tells us what it means to be in these two boxes. So for example, again, in the images, you can see that girls are supposed to become nurses, boys are supposed to become doctors, uh, or that boys are noisy, cool, and mischievous, whereas girls, they shine, smile, and sparkle. And this gendering continues throughout our lives. So here you can see shower gel is telling women it's about feeling gorgeous and men about feeling invigorated. Um, perhaps some of you have seen this Danish ad um, from Fitness World a couple of years back. They did two different sets where the one to women was uh, asking, what would you like to be called this year? And you could choose from honey, babe, snack, or milf, or bootylicious. Uh, where the one directed to men was asking, um, do you want big muscles like pecs and guns and etc.?" cetera? Um, and the images show then how you could train these muscles. And apparently you could also tell time like a man. Didn't know. Um, you might have seen this example as well from Bic, where they made a pen, especially for women. Uh, <laughs> you might as well have read how to write like a woman. Um, but the point is that it obviously has a major impact on our lives because it starts shaping the way we think both about ourselves and others. Um, and it affects then the choices that we make in relation to this and how we present ourselves in the world. Um, and it also affects, for example, uh, what we choose to study or encourage to work with. And uh, on this topic, I wanted to show uh, you this experiment that the BBC made. And although it's uh, very binary, uh, it's a good summary of what we just talked about. And it speaks also to how extremely internalized this norm is.
this. Look at this. Do you like a dolly? Shall we go for a dolly? There's a good girl. You're a good little girl, aren't you, Sophie? Look, what does this say? Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. Ooh, look at this, Sophie. Meow, meow. I think she liked that pink, pink dolly the best. If I were to tell you, actually, that Sophie is Edward. Ah. Does well, that change anything? I maybe thought, oh, this is a little girl, so I have to give her little girl things. Fella. Fella. Hello. Hello. Come on. What's this one? Oh, what's that one do? Is that a robot? What about this? Oh, you like that one. What does this one do? Oliver, Oliver. You've gone for, you could say, boy toys for possibly, this boy. Possibly, possibly in my subconscious, but t for me, I was just going for what was around me, but then perhaps my subconscious was automatically playing a trick on I If I tell you that he is actually a girl. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. I suppose it's because of the stereotype. And then that changed your behaviour yes, towards it the did. child. It did. And your behaviour was quite yeah, directive. One, two, three. Ah. Beep, 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 beep. Do you want to see my robot? She's picked up the robot, the car, the puzzle game. I think she's been much more physical in handling the child. That really astounded me because I thought that I was somebody that had a really open mind. I was surprised, um, so I automatically went for the, the pink, pink fluffy toy because I said it was a girl, so, so I was sort of stereotyping. I've always thought I was rather more open minded that, than that, and I would think, you know. These are children's toys, whatever the gender. It will make me think uh, the next time I'm with a child, so my, my niece or my nephew, to make sure that I am actually being sort of fair <laughs> and equal with all of them. Uh, and just giving each child an opportunity to just be whoever they are. Yeah, maybe you've seen that before, but I think it speaks uh, a lot to um, how, this inter how internalized this norm is um, and shows uh, unconscious bias in a good way. Because this idea about um, only two binary genders is also problematic in many other ways. Um, so apart from assuming that there is only two genders, it also assumes that all individuals are cisgender. So meaning that um, all people identify with the sex they were assigned at birth and that they live their life according to the social codes they're associated with that sex. So for example, dress in a certain way. And then at the workplace, for example, this norm means that many people would assume that you could see in a person what pronouns they use, what work clothes they would prefer, or what toilet or changing room they should go to. And this obviously causes a lot of exclusion and discrimination, especially for the trans community. And another limiting norm closely linked to the idea of two binary genders is the assumptions that, that all people are heterosexual and or that you can see on people whether they are or aren't. Uh, and this obviously strongly affects the LGBTQIA plus community's possibility to feel comfortable and be themselves, for example, at work. A study from Boston Consulting Group released this year showed that 40% of LGBTQIA plus individuals um, are not out at work and at least 26% of these employees uh, wish they could be out. And as many of us in this room and perhaps at home also know, uh, this is not necessarily explicitly about talking about sexuality at your workplace, um, but it's also about just being able to engage in social conversations. So for example, talking about what did you do this weekend or what were you up to this summer can be very difficult if you um, have to avoid talking about your partner or your partners or your family or that you have to lie about them. Um, or if you are open at work, that you end up having to answer lots of inappropriate questions about your sex life or your private life uh, that people would never dream of asking 
straight people. Um, so for example, my partner last Christmas was at the annual Christmas dinner, um, a workplace party, and after a couple of beers, uh, her colleague asked her to explain more about her sex life because he'd just been dying to know how same-sex couples did it. You know, uh, and I don't think he would ask his straight colleagues that same question. Um, yet another limiting norm that I wanted to talk about today is the idea that white skin color is the default. So for example, if you look at what's called skin or nude colored band-aids, uh, they come primarily in beige, or if you Google nude color, all you see is beige, basically, um, even though we know there are a lot more skin colors than that. Um, we also have a picture here of a body lotion that reads uh, from normal to dark skin. And this obviously sends a clear message about what skin color is considered normal and who the designer had in mind as the default. Um, and why is this important? Well, it communicates clearly who is seen, who's cared for, who's valued in our community. Um, and ultimately, it's not about the band-aids, obviously, of these products uh, in and of themselves, but it's about belonging and feeling included. Um, so these products, or the absence of them, uh, are symbols of a far broader exclusion, such as discrimination in the workplace, for example, and therefore needs to be highlighted. And representation is also linked to power, and I think that's important to remember. Sometimes people say, uh, if you can see it, you can be it. Um, and I don't know what you can see here, but uh, these are the last 15 Danish prime ministers. Um, and, you know, there's some patterns here. Uh, based on public information, at least, these prime ministers are cisgendered, most of them are men. Um, they're middle-aged-ish, uh, they're white, they're heterosexual, and they don't live with any norm-breaking disabilities. And this shows that historically, some individuals have had and have more access to power uh, and resources. And that's just not, it's not just economic, but also in terms of social networks and education, which means that they have better opportunities to shape both their own lives, but also uh, others and influence society. And power can also be about a sense of belonging um, and not constantly being questioned that you're assumed to belong in the context that you're representing. So nobody questions Mede or Lars uh, whether they really can be the prime minister. And I don't think Lars or Mede have ever heard questions like, oh, but where do you really come from? Or, you know, what was it really like to grow up in Baile? But I don't know, maybe they have. Uh, and I think this uh, model is uh, very pedagogical. Um, it's uh, called the Pyramid of Violence. Um, and it shows how what may seem as small things, such as jokes, um, can lead to more serious acts uh, of violence or discrimination because each level of the pyramid justifies the step above. So at the bottom, we have limiting norms, such as you know, expectations regarding gender, sexuality, skin color, body shape, for example. Uh, and then the next step up is normalization. So through jokes, language, objectification, for example. And then that can lead to harassment and discrimination, which then can lead to violence. And this doesn't automatically mean that, for example, ex uh, expectations about sexuality or homophobic jokes always lead to physical harassment or violence. But it shows that nothing exists in a vacuum because our language creates a culture in which violence and discrimination becomes normalized and can grow from. So then identifying and changing what lies at the bottom of the pyramid, which is something uh, that we can all influence. Um, so for example, limiting norms and um, jokes and jargon, then changing that can have a big impact when one wants to pre prevent violence, exclusion and discrimination. And I wanted to show you this video as well because it's, uh, uh, it's good to show how things like language uh, and even little things that people might even consider a compliment uh, can have a massive impact. And in this video, it's referred to as microaggressions. 
for people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you gonna have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Give me shopping advice. So I love Cher too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can, Can I touch, touch your it? Hair? Please. Oh, please. Oh, please. Oh, please. Can I please? It's fucking annoying. Oh, that makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes. <laughs> which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black one. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm. Maybe you should try this challenging major. Ow! Ah, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like he was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember. Some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggression. Yeah, and this, uh, this video shows it can also sometimes be hard to see the norm for the people who already follow the norm uh, and don't get bitten very often especially because fitting into a norm is often rewarded with status or a sense of belonging and ease. Um, so then statements like, everyone's welcome here, uh, might be very well intended, but they can also end up becoming quite offensive because they're not uh, really true always. So for example, if we go back to the stairs, um, an event saying everyone's welcome here, not uh, using it with reference to how the building is set up, and if the building has stairs, then not everyone is welcome in practice. Um, and to challenge norms, uh, like we talked about before, makes the norm visible, that it can also lead to different degrees of punishment. And this can range from funny looks or ridiculing or constantly being questioned to physical violence. Uh, and this depends on what context you move in and often what norms you challenge. So for example, going back to standing on the wrong side of the escalators, you might just get you know, a funny look. Um, but if you kiss your same-sex partner in public or you dress in a gender-fluid fashion, uh, you can have things thrown at you on the street. And this, people, um, this person here is a head teacher in Sweden and he decided to paint his nails to work because he wanted to show that uh, everyone can paint their nails uh, regardless of gender. And this does challenge and expose the norm of who's expected to wear nail polish and not. But it's also a good example of how there's different room to challenge these norms depending on how privileged you otherwise are. So for example, this person is a cisgender man, he's white, and he has power because he's the head teacher of the school. Um, so then that shows that this well-meaning phrase that we probably all said at some point, like, just be yourself, um, it's not as easy and straightforward for everyone uh, to be yourself because in some contexts that can be dangerous. And then because challenging norms leads to different degrees of punishment, we might be encouraged to or choose not to show or develop parts of who we are. Uh, and in that way we can think of people as the cookie dough here and the limiting norms as the cookie cutter um, so we end up hiding or cutting uh, parts of ourselves to fit into these limiting norms. And to acknowledge this and to talk about norms and limiting norms, you know, it's uh, sometimes people ask me, oh, so is it about forbidding women to wear dresses or men to talk about football? And of course, that's not what we're after. We're after 
uh, creating more options for everyone to be who they are uh, and to remove these limiting cookie cutters. And uh, before we move on to how to apply this approach in practice, I also want to mention three things that I think are important to remember and take with you uh, when you use this norm-critical approach in practice. Um, and the first one is called intersectionality. It's a term coined by civil, civil rights activist and professor Kimberly Crenshaw, um, and she termed it in 1989. And it's basically a lens uh, that you can use to look at how various forms of, of discrimination link together Meaning that um, one has to remember that, for example, analyzing bias in recruitment processes, you have to think about the fact that the LGBTQIA plus community is not homogenous, it's not the same. Um, because the discrimination that the individuals in this group will experience will also be very different depending on what other identity groups they also belong to. So for example, a queer presenting woman of color will most likely be treated quite differently to a cisgender white gay man. And that's really important to keep in mind if you analyze uh, groups. And another perspective that I wanted to talk about is this idea about tolerance, because tolerance has often been spoken about as something good that we should teach in schools. Um, but I would say it's quite problematic, actually. Um, partly because it means to allow or permit or put up with something that, you know, or someone that you don't agree with. Um, and partly because it implies a power dynamic of uh, where the, the privileged group can decide of if they want to put up with or don't not put up with people who challenge the norm and not the other way around. And a classic example of tolerance is when people say, oh, don't worry, I like you even though you're gay or like even though you're bisexual. Um, and I bet you've never or rarely heard anyone say, don't worry, I like you even though you're straight. Um, and that kind of exposes the norm here. Um, because you could say that tolerance focuses um, on the individuals, so changing the individuals that are outside of the norm, whilst norm critical thinking changes the perspective and focuses on the norm itself. Um, so for example, in terms of this idea of uh, coming out, so instead of telling people, oh, I like you even though you're gay, um, norm critical thinking recognizes that only some people have to come out and then it would question why is this uh, and ask what can we do about it? Uh, how can we change this structure together? Because it also norm critical thinking doesn't place the responsibility of change on the norm breakers themselves. And then finally, I wanted to talk about uh, this idea that it's easy to think that exclusion is about actively excluding people. So saying, you can't be here, or you're not allowed here. But often it's actually more about not doing anything. And I think that's really important to remember. Because un unless you then consciously include, you will act actually uh, unconsciously exclude. Uh, and then point being also that diversity doesn't automatically lead to inclusion, but that it must be an ongoing and active process. You need to think about this and work with this again and again. Right. Um, before we continue to the next half of the lecture, I thought we could just take a 10 second energizer to just stretch <laughs> uh, or take a deep breath or drink. Nice. Well done. It's uh, easier to l continue listening after this. Because having looked at the ways in which norms influence our values, our choices, and our expectations, both at work and in everyday life, we'll now continue uh, looking at how to use norm critical thinking in practice. And uh, when we do half day or full day workshops on this, the following section would include uh, a lot more exercises and examples. Wanted to include some exercises today too, but then we realized with the COVID situation, maybe we shouldn't have you <laughs> talk to each other. Um, 
So then we thought that we'd give you an overview of the norm critical evaluation process that we work with and then end with some takeaway points that we hope that can be useful to you. Um, and as we spoke about before, we come from different contexts uh, and are able to probably take different things from this. So we'll start with a more organizational perspective and then end with things that we can all do as individuals uh, at our workplaces. Maybe you've seen this cartoon before. It's done the rounds on the internet. Um, but it basically shows a variety of animals of different sizes and weights and capabilities lined up. And then the examiner at the front says, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb this tree. And as you can imagine, this will be quite an easy task for some of the animals, like the monkey, and very hard or impossible for other animals, like the fish, for example, um, since this, they have other skills. And the point here is that the task they've been given is designed according to one individual skill set. And this is often how it also works uh, at workplaces or in schools or at events. Um, we design these places with only the most normative individuals in mind, yet all staff members or students or participants are supposed to feel at home or invited. And that's why step number one in this process is to reflect. Uh, it's about thinking about um, who is already here, uh, who's already included, um, who's our organization built for, and who can easily feel at work or feel at home here, uh, which individuals or groups establish the rules at our workplace. So examples would be if you work with events, for example, who do we have in mind um, automatically when we design this workshop or event? Uh, if you look at marketing, which target groups does our, our organization reach automatically? Uh, if you work with design, uh, who can use our products without any problems? Who are they directed to? Um, if you look at re recruitment, um, are there patterns in who applies for a job at our workplace already? Because looking at this will then give us a clue to understand who, who's not here, uh, what groups are not included today. And if you're new to norm critical thinking uh, or need some inspiration, sometimes it can be helpful to use things like the EU law on workplace discrimination as a starting point for reflection. Um, this law bans workplace discrimination on the grounds of age, sex, disability, which also includes mental health conditions and learning disabilities, uh, ethnic or racial origin, religion or belief, or sexual orientation. And then in Sweden, uh, they've added gender identity or expression to this list. Uh, and I would say this list is by no means complete uh, you could, for example, add things like uh, body size and socioeconomic background, but it's somewhere to start from. Because then when you reflected on who's already present and who's not, you can then start by examining uh, why is it that we don't reach these groups? What obstacles do we have in our organization? So for example, is our workshop accommodating if you use a wheelchair? Um, are you able to get time off if you celebrate other holidays than Christian holidays? Does our office have gender neutral toilets? Does it feel comfortable to participate at our social events if you don't drink alcohol or if you don't eat meat? Um, is our website responsive in terms of colorblindness? Uh, is the jargon in our office accommodating if you're gay? Is our marketing accommodating if you're not that good with social media or technology, for example? And then once we found out the answer to these questions or whatever questions that would be relevant in your context, we can start looking for new solutions and then ask, okay, well, what can we do to remove some of these obstacles? How can we find new solutions and how can we reach new groups of people? So for example, uh, could our products be designed in a way that suits uh, more people? So uh, for example, here they've made underwear in all skin colors instead of just beige skin color. 
Uh, can we ensure that we have a wheelchair accessible office and always use wheelchair accessible event spaces? Um, can we think about how we describe our workplace when we're looking for new staff? What questions do we ask in interviews? Do we ask the same questions to all applicants? Do we have diverse recruiting panels? Um, can we take a closer look at representation in images and text? Who's visible in relation to what job? Um, can we make sure to put our pronouns in our email signatures? Can we design our website in readable color combinations? And these are, of course, just some examples. But then in terms of keeping uh, the diverse workforce and create sustainable change, we also have to make sure to embed these new changes or initiatives in the organizational DNA to ensure that they don't just become one-hit wonders or, you know, like a theme day a year and then everyone forgets about it. Um, and this requires a long-term focus and it requires regular work and it requires for it to be embedded in meetings uh, and also that it's everyone's responsibility. Um, and for that to work, it requires clear descriptions of how your particular workplace intends to do this. So, you know, it's not enough to say, oh, well, we'll just deal with it when it becomes a problem. Um, but you have to have a plan or a policy that clearly reflects, first of all, does, what does it mean to work here? Um, how can we make sure that everyone who works here feels at home? And how is this reflected in our daily work? And can we make that even clearer? Because often it's quite fuzzy and fluffy. Um, And then when you work out guidelines or policies like this, uh, try and make sure to work them out together and have representatives from all parts of the organization involved in the process. Um, I'd also recommend that you find ways to keep it up to date, so review it regularly. Um, make sure it's visible to everyone. Uh, maybe a silly but good example, I think, uh, is um, a workplace that I work with that put up their guidelines uh, in the bathrooms, because people spend time there anyway, so then they were constantly reading uh, these guidelines and thinking about, okay, well, you know, what type of workplace am I working at? Um, and make this, these policies understandable. It's very uh, common that they include a lot of complicated terms or abbreviations, um, and then it becomes difficult to put into practice. Uh, and on that topic, I'd also say make it concrete. It's, it's easy to kind of slide into this like nice words and it's very fuzzy. But you know, concrete, like what does it actually mean if we say that everyone should be able to be themselves at our workplace? And then also important, discuss internally what you do um, if people breach these guidelines, if something happens and discuss this before it happens. Um, and consider, can you create more direct channels of complaint or feedback at your workplace? So if you're a big organization, you know, how can you make sure you don't have to go through five different instances to get your complaint through? So here, yeah, reflect, examine, rethink, and embed. Um, it's a super quick overview uh, of this norm critical process that we use to work with organizations, and I wish we could spend more time on it. Um, but I want to say that it's important to remember also that it is a process. So it must be used continuously again and again at all levels of the organization, both internally and externally. But we can also use a non-critical perspective on a more everyday level, um, which is something that we can all do even if we don't have the power to decide about policies, etc because at the end of the day, we are each other's work environment and we should all take responsibility for making our workplace inclusive. And then in terms of making people feel at home, it's important to evaluate uh, things like more informal settings at work as well. And here, language is often key. Uh, if you remember the pyramid that we spoke about before, changing language can change uh, a lot. And you can think about what types of jokes and jargon do we have at our workplace? Can we talk about what's okay and not okay to joke about? Um, could we use a more gender neutral language? So for example, uh, using words like partner or spouse instead of husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend. 
Um, or can we use uh, things like chairperson instead of chairman? Um, we could also think about, instead of talking about us and them, we could say those of us who, so for example, those of us who don't eat meat um, at the Christmas dinner, da da da. Um, and then you can think about space as well. Think about uh, how, how much space is taken up uh, by whom. So for example, when we hold meetings, uh, who gets to speak? How much do they get to speak? Uh, who gets credited for their ideas? And then lastly, um, a very simple and difficult advice is to stop assuming and start listening. So to let people tell you about who they are and let them decide how much or how little uh, or what they want to share about themselves. And we want to end with this kind of cheesy, but <laughs> good point, I think, um, to, to remember that even seemingly small change do make a difference, so we can all be a part of this together. Cool, that's all that we had uh, today. Maybe you have some questions? Yes, I see there's a question down there. If you're sitting at home, please uh, take this time now to send in some questions. Uh, so we have, if you're sitting with something big or small, send it in and we will get around this as much as possible. But yeah, let's me get your question. I'm holding the microphone. Um, I just wonder, in terms of CVs in Denmark, you have to put your, usually you have to put your sexual orientation and I just wonder how you, f how you feel about that. Because I, I feel, coming from London, where it's, it's, almo it's almost like positive discrimination straight off the bat. And I just think that, that's, I find that really confusing in a country like Denmark that's otherwise very liberal. Or you mean, where would you have to put your sexual? Like at the, like at the top, if you're, if you're like married or if you're single or if. Yeah, in, in forms. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear, yeah, on your CV, okay. Yeah, um, I think uh, in terms of CVs, um, working with bias blockers is like making it more anonymous is better. Um, and then you can talk about the internal workplace culture uh, and how we talk about sexualities and such and how much people want to share. But in terms of CVs, I think uh, less information uh, that can make things more biased. But it's the same with pictures, right? I believe in the UK, you don't put your picture on the CV, whereas here, that's very common as well. Yeah. If, if I may interject on yours, uh, I'm job seeking right now here in Denmark. Uh, nowhere, no company have ever asked my sexual orientation. They might ask if I have a partner or something. So you are not, and they are not allowed to ask of your sexual orientation at all. Yeah. They can ask if you're, you're married or have a partner, but that's it. And I'm actually in doubts of the legality of that again, and as well as if you have to inform. But your sexual orientation is a no-go, and you do not need to write it. Mm. But I think that's a, it's a good point as well, this with job seeking and, and interviews as well, because you could discuss what questions are relevant to ask. I was also quite surprised in Denmark when um, people ask things about um, family and partners, and you, know, uh, you could ask, is that relevant information for a job interview and evaluate that beforehand. And also, like I said before, make sure to ask the same questions to then uh, all individuals that you um, interview, yeah. Um, so I, I was wondering uh, for implementing this in the workspace, for example, it could create some anxiety for some coworkers uh, feeling that they are not capable to relate to your to your identity, in a way. Um, how, how, what, what are your thoughts about this? And um, how, can, how can we prevent this anxiety? Um, well, I think education is uh, really important. And, uh, you know, to and also make sure that everyone gets the education, not just leaders, um, but everyone in the workplace, so that you have a common ground to speak from as well and refer to. Because, of course, not everyone uh, knows this already, you have studied. Um, and it also, if you have an education like that, it, it again removes the responsibility to explain and be sort of the dictionary uh, from the people who are the norm breakers in the workplace. So yeah, more education, I would say. Thank you.
I actually have a question myself uh, regarding the organizational culture. Do you have any examples of some companies who have made some dr drastical changes in how they include people and uh, include diversity? Uh, do they do it top bottom, top to bottom, or bottom to top? Is it leader driven, or is the employees who derives it, or is it because they hire consultants like you to come in and help them make these changes? Uh, what do companies do to make changes in this right now? Mm, well, in Denmark, I'd say there's a lot of focus on uh, gender and some focus on sexuality primarily, but some companies have started working with more critical thinking, and I know that CBS and Quinfo uh, have driven um, a project called Gender Lab where they worked actively with this as well and have some good results. But I would say in regards to leadership that uh, the best results are obviously if the leadership is uh, also implementing this and driving this change because it is hard to push from the bottom and again that places the responsibility on the norm breakers uh, rather than the leadership. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you also. Uh, we also got a question online. Um, is it in your view? Is it in your view, okay to assume that a child is uh, cisgender up to a certain age? Um, good question. I guess I, I think I would need to know a little bit more about the context to answer this question and uh, why you would need to know it. Um, I would say off the bat, I would say no. Um, yeah. I think the context was uh, when you showed the video of uh, the g uh, kids playing yeah. with toys and how they uh, were perceived to be one gender by yeah, how they looked compared to, yeah. Yeah, and there I think uh, the video is also talking a lot more about gender norms and what they do to us, so um, making sure we bring our kids up in a more gender neutral way, how they can create more space for everyone to develop into who they are and not placing assumptions on them. We also got another question. Uh, what is your take on bias training and does it work? Yeah, uh, good question. I think uh, bias training in relation, um, like talking about, for example, bias blockers such as removing names uh, from the CV or personal information, in, but then also working with the internal culture uh, and talking about uh, inclusion and diversity hand in hand is very important. Yeah, uh, I have another question myself. Um, when there was this video about microaggressions, um, because I for one is one who can sometimes oversimplify things, uh, do it the short way. I sometimes when I get into a room, I just say, hey guys, regarding of gender of the persons in the room actually, is that um, some kind of yeah, microassertion versus the norm versus simplification where, where can we say, is there any lines here? Uh, is it okay to simplify in some cases whereas it would be viewed as a microaggression in other cases? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the point there about microaggressions is also about that uh, it's not always uh, ill-intended and sometimes people even uh, say compliments that can be offensive. Um, but it's about then thinking about, okay, recognizing that, oh, I use this uh, language, for example, hey guys, uh, and thinking about what are gender neutral terms that I could use instead, like hey folks, or yeah, things like that. Okay, we get another question here on, from online. Uh, from my experience, it feels like those of us who are not from the, not the norm are more pronoun I'm sorry, I'm more prone to learn about talk and talk about subjects that challenge norm-critical thinking. How do we put the responsibility on those who are in the norm to start learning about and thinking about these topics? Yeah, again there I think it's important that the leadership at a workplace, for example, gets involved and uh, instigate this as some type of training that um, everyone needs to engage in. Um, but which also neutralizes it more um, and implements it more throughout the whole workplace um, so that everyone can take part. But it is difficult sometimes to, to drive that um, and it depends. I mean, some people have the energy to fight back or educate uh, and some people don't and that's obviously totally okay. Um, and that's why it's important that it comes also from the top in a company. Yes, we got a question here. 
and in continuation with uh, this this topic on more sort of practical level, how do you communicate this, I guess, empathy that is needed for the norm to understand? Because if it's just text-based, it could sound like a finger wagging. Uh, you know, would you recommend uh, scenarios, uh, images, some w some way of explaining where it actually can, uh, where you sort of, you can end up in sort of a gray zone for the, um, for let's say an LGBT person, where it's, it's hard to explain in words. How you know? How do you sort of convey the conflict um, in a guideline? Because sometimes, yeah, yeah, I can. You know, if you read the guideline, yeah, yeah, of course, this is a no-brainer, blah, blah, blah. But it's the underlying things, the, the underlying emotions, and um, um, yeah, I don't really know how to uh, formulate it. That's the problem. Um, so, so what, practically, what would you recommend? when it is uh, top down, what, what works in that yeah. sort of situation? If you're going to try to change an organization or to keep them mindful on a daily basis uh, of their behavior. Mm. And, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is, it can be really tricky. Um, but again, I would say this a combination um, of like looking at diversity and inclusion. So talking about the more sort of abstract things about changing organizational culture and with training. So I think it's quite effective if you do, for example, full day workshops where you discuss norms and people get to think about, okay, but what norms do I fit into? Where do I stand outside? And, and I think norm critical thinking can be good in a way also because it shows that, for example, let's say a cisgender white man will fit into some norms that you can discuss um, and for example, you can talk about masculinity norms, how are they restricting, even though they're not perhaps as restricting as other norms, it's still a way of kind of making people understand it within their body, they don't just become the bad one. Uh, and then you can talk about it at the workplace. Um, but yeah, I think exercises are really, really important in that sense to, to discuss it as well. But, but also then led by somebody who knows what they're doing because they can, otherwise it can really spiral. Um, in the wrong direction, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's also a follow-up. Um, so I completely agree with you with education, like education is the way forward and exercising. Um, but when do you think it should start? Like, do you, th do you think it should start in the workspace uh, or should it start, or sh should it be implemented in the educational system and when will Will it be the right time to start, uh, the right age for starting the conversation? Yeah, good Thanks. question. Because um, to, today we're here to talk about the workspace, but um, maybe I've forgotten to say, but yeah, I would definitely think it should be implemented from a very young age. And I think that it's really important that our teachers as well are educated uh, within norm critical thinking so that they can teach in a more norm critical manner in schools, because uh, that would help a lot. Um, but yeah, absolutely, from a very young age. I don't know, when you're born? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think this type of thinking, you know, is so related also to our everyday that it's the parent then can teach the child to, to be able to, so that they can have space to grow into who they want to become or are. thing back in the days. Yeah. Uh, now sexuality is implemented in the school system. Uh, but when do you think it's like that kids are ready to talk about it? Because I, I remember myself like um, how these ideas about a boy's behavior, like you should behave like a boy, were enforced like from quite an early age. And um, it, they were enforced mostly because of the environment you know, dealing with other kids in the play playground and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering, like, when should we start? Yeah, um, no, it is very, it's a good question. Um, but I would say that <laughs> I'm not a child psychologist, so I don't know exactly 
how our brains develop uh, like that. But I would say that you can also talk about these things in uh, with children, but in a different manner, of course. So if you talk about, for example, uh, sexual consent has also come up before. So like, should you really speak to children about this? But that can be a way of talking about what is your body, you know, what are you, are you allowed to say no when a, uh, when a relative wants to force you to hug them? Yes, you are allowed to just say no. And that's also about consent. So we can talk about it in different ways with children, I would say. But we can discuss this more afterwards. I think we're about to run out of time. We are actually out of time and it's a little bit sad because I had two good questions and <laughs> still. So um, I will read them out loud. Uh, you can think about them, everybody can think about them. Um, and I saw your mail up there. So to the people at home, uh, we didn't get time to the questions, but uh, right. Um, it's a very simple question. Uh, to a non-profit or not so much profit-driven company, is there any good um, cases for business to be more inclusive and diverse? And um, is the situation where positive, di di positive discrimination and uh, micro aggression overlap? Uh, that was the two questions we unfortunately didn't have the time for. Elin, uh, so I will just have to say, Elin, thank you very much. It's been a really interesting talk. Um, at 13 and a, or in a half.